good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those who don't know, I am Artis Bergstotti, the organizer of the Rocks Lecture ser Series. And thank you all for joining us in this first uh, lecture of the Rocks Lecture Series in um, 2023. So today I have the pleasure of introducing two speakers, uh, the literary scholar and Rocks postdoc Oeder Adelsteinsdottir and Søren Frank, Professor of Comparative Lit Literature at the University of Southern Denmark. Um, they will talk to us today about maritime literature and the importance of blue humanities in times of climate change. I'm delighted to have both of you with us today and without further ado, I now hand the virtual microphone over to you. Thank you. Um, do you hear me? Yes, I'm, uh, I'm going to start with a short introduction. Um, the ocean is of utmost importance when confronting past and present climate changes, as has been stated by oceanographers and literary scholars alike. Uh, Catherine Richardson says we ignore the impact of climate change on the ocean at our own peril and in his book A Poetic History of the Oceans, Søren Frank emphasizes the historical importance of the ocean and that literary history as we are used to reading it is admittedly a history authored by humans about human earthbound existence. However, on closer examination, it is also a history of entanglements between the human and the non-human, between the terrestrial and the nautical. Hence the need for an amphibian approach to literature. So today, Søren will introduce some of the themes of his book, uh, which can be found online in open access. And he will start off by talking about changing human conceptions uh, of the ocean. So, Søren. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and thank you for showing up um, to everyone. I noticed a couple of names that uh, that I'm familiar with, but uh, otherwise I don't think I uh, know many of you. Um, so today I will be speaking uh, roughly for about 20 minutes, I think, um, and I have uh, divided my talk into two parts. First, I will talk about the changing human conceptions of the ocean. Um, uh, as mentioned, um, so last uh, year I published this uh, book with Brill, which is out in a very expensive hardback, but uh, thanks to uh, support from the Carlsberg Foundation, we also managed to publish it uh, as an open access um, uh, publication. So please uh, look it up if you are interested. Um, what I will talk about today is, is, uh, is uh, parts of the book. So my first part of the talk will I will do without a manuscript. Uh, I will very briefly run through the the, the four historical uh, paradigms um, which I found um, in my book uh, to um, to kind of cover the history of the ocean and the way that uh, the human conception of the ocean has changed. And and um, my, my second part of the talk I will I have a written paper. Um, which will deal with uh, why blue humanities. So let me start with this um, intriguing quote from Jules Michelet and his um, very fascinating historical um, book, um, La Mer, uh, in which he says that the element which we call fluid, mobile, and capricious does not really change. It is regularity itself. What is constantly changing is man. So what Jules Michelet here says is that, in fact, the ocean doesn't really change. It is us that changes. It is 
it, it and and through our changes we also um look upon the ocean differently uh, in different historical epochs so briefly i will be talking about these introducing these four mar uh, four maritime world pictures which i found in my book um to be um kind of paradigmatic for certain epochs but it's also very important for me to 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 underline that 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 there are no sharp distinctions although i have um, uh, periodicized the, the the world pictures it is very important to emphasize that they recycle and interlink um, but but this is also roughly a skeleton of how um, of how uh, humans have conceived of the ocean first of all uh, what i call a theo theocentric worldview um, up until uh, the middle of the 15th century and then four centuries covering what I call the anthropocentric uh, worldview, and then uh, replaced by a technocentric worldview from 1850 to 1950, uh, which is then replaced by an ecological or ecocentric worldview. So now briefly, I will just introduce what is um, characteristic of the four worldviews before moving on to, to, to discussing uh, why blue humanities and and maritime literature is important in an age of climate change. So what is characteristic of the theocentric worldview is that the dominant component in that worldview is, uh, is, is a religious worldview or God as, um, as, a, as a character. Um, the, 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 the kind of motto that, uh, that signifies this world is non plus ultra, that is, the, the inscription on, on the, the pillars of Hercules in, in the Mediterranean, which means that there is nothing beyond. There's, not, there's nothing beyond uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, so people were urged to stay put, to, 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 um, to, to stay within the limits of, um, of, um, of, uh, of the Mediterranean and, and Europe. Uh, the ocean was seen as a barrier and the creatures uh, below the surface were considered more or less monsters. Again, it's important to emphasize that, that the, the, these are kind of uh, uh, certain types. It is, of course, a, a bit exaggerated because people at the time, of course, knew that there were fish in the ocean, but, but it, it was a, a worldview that was, of course, uh, very much dominated also by uh, superstition. This is also an era in which uh, humans were uh, urged to know their own limits, which were uh, stay put, um, stay where you are. You are not uh, urged to, uh, uh, to transgress any boundaries. Uh, in, in, in general, sea voyaging was uh, seen as a risk. So if we move on to what I call the anthropocentric era, um, it is now humans that are uh, considering uh, themselves as centers of the world, not so much uh, God. The uh, inscription on the pillars of Hercules, non plus ultra, has now been changed by uh, Charles V uh, into plus ultra. There is something beyond uh, these limits of the Mediterranean. So uh, humans were um, now looking upon the ocean as not a barrier, but as a passage. Monsters were replaced by fish, and um, humans were exploring the world in a much uh, larger uh, degree than they uh, did before 1450. This is, of course, the, the beginning of the of the of the age of discovery. And what is very interesting is that the concept of contingency was at this time um moving into new semantic fields so contingency no longer only meant risk as in the former worldview now it also um it was supplemented by the semantic meaning of chance so contingency was not only riskful but also uh, a, a, an opportunity a chance to to uh, to seek uh, wealth to seek new territories in the world so the third worldview is technocentrism. Um, now 
uh, modern technology becomes a dominating component in, in, uh, in, in, in the human relationship to the ocean and to nature, we are still in a, in a worldview in which there is something beyond. Man is uh, still looking upon the ocean as a passageway to, to greater richness and to greater wealth, um, to new discoveries. It is uh, now the machine age instead of the, the age of the fish. These are two metaphors from the, the German uh, philosopher, uh, Karl Schmidt, who says that during the, the 19th century, the ocean transforms itself from fish to machine, metaphorically speaking, of course. It's no longer the age of sail, but, but the age of steam uh, driven by coal. Whereas, Humans lived in an age of exploration in the, uh, in, the, in the former period. Now they live in an age of control. They believe that they, through uh, mathematical models and science, uh, were able to control uh, their surroundings. Um, and they, they in, instead of uh, living in a riskful or, or um, opportunistic world, they believed that they could actually calculate and prognosticize uh, the future. So the final uh, um, maritime world picture, I call them, is, uh, is the 1950 until today, which is a kind of a, uh, the, the ecological era, uh, the era of, um, of nature. Um, whereas we humans thought that we lived in an age of, or world view, view of plus ultra, there is something beyond. Now we are maybe returning to a, uh, a, a thinking in which uh, there are limits to growth. Um, so in, the ocean is now, instead of a passage, maybe seen as, a, as an ecosystem. And um, the fish has been supplemented, the ocean as fish has been supplemented by uh, the ocean as a plastic ocean. It's no longer steam, but diesel. We live in an oil regime now. Maybe humans have become impotent in the face of, um, in the face of climate change. We uh, thought we were in control. Maybe if we reach the certain tipping points, we are no longer in control. We are maybe even left impotent in the face of uh, earth processes running amok. If we lived in a regime where we believed calculation uh, would, um, would bring us forward, now we maybe live in an age where we have seen how, what miscalculation uh, might uh, do to our planet. So this was my very, very short um, introduction to these four world maritime world pictures, which, um, which are the basis of, of the first historical chapter in my book, which is about 130 pages, I, I think, um, a chapter in which I read literature uh, from Homer and Horace to, um, to the Danish navigator Jens Munk to uh, Camões from Portugal. I read an, um, an, um, uh, the, 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 the saga of the Greenlanders. I read Shakespeare. I read, um, um, well, literature uh, up until Joseph Conrad, more or less. Um, so I will now move on to a more written part of my manuscript uh, of my of my presentation, in which I ask the overall question: Why blue humanities? So through human enterprises at sea, the maritime world has played a role in bringing about this new epoch labeled the Anthropocene. And some of its effects have now begun to destabilize the oceanic environments on the planet. Rising sea levels, escalating amounts of plastic debris, and increasing acidification are but three of numerous consequences trigger, triggering a plethora of other damaging processes. The oceans are at one and the same time scenes of causes and arenas of effects but without ever really having had the power of determination in the matter. I will now shortly return to Jules Michelet, who, who, whom we saw had this intriguing quote in the beginning of, of, of my talk, 
where he said that the ocean doesn't change, it's actually humanity that changes. Michelet was right in the second part, but time has proved him wrong in his first claim. The ocean does actually change. We thought it was eternal permanence, but it has turned out to be a hyper object which we have uh, caused to change. So until recently, most people would have agreed with Michelet, but no more. He turned out to be too optimistic on the ocean's behalf. He lived in a time during which the ideas of humans as a telluric force and of tipping points were unimaginable. It has now become evident that the ocean has undergone physical chemical changes and since 1800, uh, sorry, since 1800, and even more so since 1945, on a scale that we never thought possible. These changes were caused by human activities. The idea of a boundless dumping ground capable of absorbing the pressures of human activities, the idea of the ocean as the quintessence of permanence has been irreversibly shattered. What role can aesthetic products and the humanities possibly play in understanding the Anthropocene and its very tangible challenges and dangers? After all, these challenges, dangers, and the epoch epical phenomenon itself seem to be of such complexity and scope that only hard data and science can save us from our own misdeeds. However, measuring does not equal understanding. In the shock of the Anthropocene, Bonoy and Fresseau reflects on the relationship between hard science, humanities, and stories. Scientists have built up data and models that already situate us beyond the point of no return to the Holocene, on the timetable of geological epochs. They have produced figures and curves that depict humanity as a major geological force. But what narratives can make sense of these dramatic curves, they ask poignantly. Let me propose some possible answers to their question. Aesthetic products can serve as an archive of stories from which the political, the ethical, and the existential histories of the Anthropocene can be reconstructed and remembered, and in which mankind's exceptionality has been challenged. Writing a novel may not solve the actual challenges of the Anthropocene, nor will an analysis of that novel. But novels and other aesthetic products may serve as translators of graphs and hard data, thereby offering their readers a mediating rewiring of the spheres of abstraction and concretion. Writers and artists may grapple with questions concerning the politics of the carbon economy and the extinction of the species, but they may also link such questions to human cultural practices, for example, flight, uh, flight, flight travel, travel, imagination, for example, cosmopolitanism, and desires, for example, freedom, and their potential complicity in the Anthropocene. Crucial questions addressed in narratives could be the following. How are the numbers and graphs felt and experienced by individuals and local communities? What ethical dilemmas emerge in the face of rising sea levels and pollution? What societal models and conceptions of the human nature relationship exist in the archives? What future imaginaries are proposed in speculative fiction? The narratives called for by Bonoy and Fresseau serve not only as translators of data and mediators between science and everyday life, though. They potentially carry their own epistemological benefits, producing a different type of knowledge through their languages, forms, and points of view. A knowledge more embedded more experiential, more concrete, and more existential than the one characteristic of scientific discourse. To make sense signifies not only acts of giving meaning to something, 
but also making that something sensuous. One of the most important implications of that adapting a blue humanities approach is the transformation of ecology from green to blue. The ocean radicalizes some of the dilemmas in environmentalism. Ideas of human control, sustainable growth, and harmony between humankind and nature are seriously questioned when blue ocean replaces green pastures as a starting point for any discussions on ecology and environment. As Steve Menz has pointed out, our newer fables of ecological harmony can't keep us dry. The wet nightmares of environmental destruction and the instability associated, associated with the stingy salt water of the oceans inundate any cheerful dreams of environmentalism associated with topoi, such as the beach and the park. In the background of such idea, ideas looms the question of gradualism versus catastrophism, two powerful narrative structures in the science of geology. <clears throat> Blue humanities in the age of the Anthropocene view humans not as masters and owners of nature, but increasingly as beings entangled with the vast feedback loops of the earth system. The ocean and seafaring are reminders of humanity's profound entanglements with nature and the non-human, of the illusion of any deep essential split between humans and their environment. If the ocean alienizes our globe, it is in the sense of making it unfamiliar to us, not separate from us. The sea is at the same time the condition and boundary of our human exist existence. What Herman Melville called the masterless ocean constantly reminds us that we control neither ocean nor globe. Indeed, there are beneficial outcomes of our ecological era. The increasing awareness of a greater mutuality between the planet's different elements and parts, the softening of anthropocentric concerns and the dispersion of agency, and a deepening sense of intimacies instead of separations are potential life buoys that we may grab hold of as the instability of the planet increases. As scientists discovered in the 19th century, the ocean is the conductor of the planet's climate, acting both as, both as thermostat and driving force in ways we still cannot accurately predict. In an Anthropocene era of climate change that has left behind the relative stability of the Holocene, the world is becoming bluer, wetter, and messier. If neither the old nor the newer fables of ecological harmony can keep us dry, then we need what Mens has labeled wet fables that both match and figure the great oceans and their role in Earth history. In addition, we need a method with which to read such fables. The good news is that we have these stories already. Instead of fables of ecological harmony, let us call them wet fables of blue ecology. And here is just a a, 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 I wouldn't say small list, but a, a, a part of the books that I read in, um, in my book, uh, both newer uh, works uh, from the Nordic countries, uh, the US, but also more canonical uh, readings of uh, canonical works uh, from, from the 19th century, such as Herman Melville, Victor Hugo and Jules Verne, and also older uh, books, both canonical and non-canonical, um, Shakespeare, uh, Homer, uh, the saga of the Icelanders, and uh, as I mentioned, Jens Munk's uh, logbook from 1619. Just as literature and literary criticism cannot cure cancer, 
they are likewise unable to shield coastal residences from tsunamis and hurricanes and prevent the melting of the ice caps. However, our Western culture is defined by a persistent struggle with living in dynamic, unpredictable, semi-aquatic environments. This struggle has been waged on the battlefields of language and narrative forms, as much as on the battlefields of science and engineering. I'm moving into the last part of my talk now. Eco-criticism has been green eco-criticism, but time has come to turn it blue. We need to challenge our propensity for landlocked stories of human struggles to cult cu cultivate, calculate, and control nature, that is, agricultural and pastoral visions of sustainability and predictability, and start focusing on waterlocked stories of human improvisations and collaborations with a disorderly world in flux and nautical visions of menacing and capricious environments. What I call an amphibian comparative literature approach, approaches these stories with a belief that they can assist us in welcoming and maybe even withstanding saltwater pro propelled turmoil. Oceanic space is more than human. The ocean challenges any aspirations of unconditional anthropocentrism. Plastic ocean and mounting ocean result from anthropogenic behavior, but they now seem to strike back against humanity, leaving us impotent in the face of ocean-driven climate change. In the confrontation and entanglement with the ocean, human actors are translocated from controlling and disembodied heights and plunged into the depths of ambigu ambiguity, flux, and dissolution. It's because of this experimental and empirical dimension of the maritime that the non-human and post-human environment of the ocean is of great value in this era of anthropogenic climate change. Since the Earth's history has fallen back into human history and destroyed the enlightenment dream of separating society from nature, humans have found themselves living in an increasingly unstable and destructive environment whose physically overwhelming manifestations resemble the flux and fluidity of the masterless ocean more than the solidity and stability of cultivated land. The ecological crisis resembles a shipwreck in that they both produce feelings of disorientation and disruption. In many of the texts and sources that I analyze in my book, the reader encounters unembellished visions of humans, most of them male sailors, trapped between divine decree, natural forces, and inadequate assurances of individual agency and technological assistance. Nautical tales depicting the practical labors of sailors in crisis, often denigrated in rational modernity, yet celebrated by writers from Homer, Monk and Cooper to Hugo Conrad and Bjornebo, because imperative for survival represent valuable stories of how humans endure when faced with uncontrollable non-human powers. As sea levels rise and numerous hurricanes wreck seaside residences in the Anthropocene, we have become increasingly aware of the upsetting and bewildering entanglements of humans and oceans. No one has been better at depicting and fabricating these entanglements than writers and artists sailors and scientists then and now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I Thank think you. you are going to. Um... Yeah, I'm going to, I was going to share my yeah. So. So, yeah. Um now I'm going to move uh into uh, Icelandic literature and to kind of continue where uh, Søren left off. 
So um, Iceland's rapid modernization was a dominant theme in the 20th century Icelandic literature, and 21st century writers continue to revisit the swift steps made towards modernity at the turn of the 20th century. Um, in his historical novels, 60 Kilos of Sunshine from 2018 and 60 Kilos of Knockouts from 2021, which I will refer to ah. here collectively as the Kilos, the author Hallgrimur Helgason describes how Icelanders managed an abrupt move from turf huts uh, lit with fish oil and shark hunts in open boats to wooden houses with electric lights and an advanced fishing industry. And he turns our attention to the fact that the unexpected path that led Icelanders to modernity was paved by a creature they until then had thought little of, herring. Uh, although harvesting the sea has always been necessary for survival in Iceland, it was only in the 20th century that fishing replaced agriculture as the country's uh, most profitable in industry. Uh, this development was met with suspicion in the first half of the 20th century, and life at fishing stations was often depicted as one of poverty, immorality, and low culture as Gisli Paulson has noted. Uh, I hope the, the slides are showing. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, nostalgia <laughs> for the farming society likely contributed to the trend described by Rúnar Helgi Vignison <laughs> of the lost rural life being given more importance in modern Icelandic literature than fishing villages and the sea. But in the kilos, the ocean plays a vital and complex role. It is always in view, uh, so that when the main character looks out of the window of his home, he feels that he and the rest of the household are on a ship, on their way to uncertain seas and even another land. So at the turn of the 20th century, the herring, which Icelanders had for the most part not even considered edible, suddenly turned into the silver of the sea. As the narrator of the Kilos speculates, it is of course likely that this protected environment, that is, uh, this great rejection from Icelanders, was the very reason why the herring had now washed up on shore, had almost come all the way to the door and knocked, begging people to use it for bait, brine it, eat it, love it. There are, however, more complex reasons for the abundance of herring in the sea north and east of Iceland at the time. Herring are plankton feeders, and the production of the favorite plankton, which is a zooplankton, is affected by environmental factors like changes in climate. These zooplanktons feed on phytoplanktons, and as Kirstine Drum explained in her presentation at Rock Lectures Rock Lecture Series, Iceland is situated in a productive area when it comes to phytoplanktons. But phytoplankton communities are also very dependent on the physical factors surrounding them, winds, currents, salinity, temperature, etc. The Icelandic herring adventure is an example of how fluctuations in these environmental factors can drive on great social changes. Oceanographer Steingrimur Jónsson recently pointed out to me that almost 20 years ago he co-authored a paper where the story of the Icelandic fishing village Siglufjörður is used as a case study of complex interactions between physical, biological, and social systems. And the aim of the article was to contribute to a realistic thinking about the human dimensions of climate change. Here we come to the fact that after the uh, Norwegians started fishing for her herring from Iceland in the late 19th century, the processing of herring started to draw in hundreds of Icelanders who wanted a piece of the profits. Suddenly, the quiet fishing village of Siglufjörður was transformed. A gold dress like atmosphere settled over the town, leading to Siglufjörður being dubbed the Atlantic Klondike. Life on land was just as colorful. The streets of Siglufjörður were so jammed with crowds and activities that they resembled the teeming avenues of major cities. In Hallgrimur Helgason's book series, this transitive state engenders a true carnival in the sense of Mikhail Bakhtin, 
who argued that the ancient culture of grotesque folk humor took on the form of the carnival in the Renaissance, both in life and the arts, and that lives, this lives on in literature, although in diluted form. According to Bakhtin, events like marketplace festivals were the second life of the people, who for a time entered the utopian realm of community, freedom, equality, and abundance. The carnival spirit offers us a new outlook on the world with a peculiar logic of the inside out of the turnabout of a continual shifting from top to bottom, from front to rear of numerous parodies and travesties, humiliations, profanations, comic crownings and uncrownings. Alta Björk Valdemarsdóttir has, in this book, discussed Hallgrimur Helgason's use of the carnival in his former novels and visual art, and on the cover of Alta's book is a self-portrait by Hallgrimur. In general, uh, Hallgrimur is an author who revels in grotesque humor, and his texts are often an excessive flow of words, full of puns and double meaning. In the kilos, he continues to use grotesque humor and the philosoph philosophy of the carnival, as described by Mikhail Bakhtin, to offer his own interpretation of the Icelandic herring adventure. In the Kilo, Siglufjörður becomes the carnivalesque industrial marketplace of Segulfjörður, which means Magnetfjörð, draw, drawing in both local and foreign opportunists, mostly unruly seamen, temporarily disturbing the social order. The Kilos are a story that recounts how modernity sailed to port in North Iceland, as it says on the back cover of 60 Kilos of Sunshine, and the characters must adapt to a fast changing reality. The Herring adventure created prime circumstances for swindles, crime, violence and death, but also for new hope and unprecedented freedom. In the Kilos, Hallgrimur Helgason offers an explanation of why the Icelanders were ready to embrace the state, describing them as people who are still marked by centuries of oppression, by natural forces, by foreign rule, and by an unjust social system. According to the story's carnivalesque logic, this equipped Icelanders with exactly the right tools to exploit the herring adventure, an unexpected gift from the capricious sea, which helped both individuals and the nation gain financial independence. However, the laughter of the carnival, which is always self-directed, according to Bakhtin, prevents this from becoming a national romantic tale. Instead of heroes, we have tricksters and debased officials, and the narrator of the, kil of the kilos makes countless jokes out of Icelanders' insistence on living in the moment and waiting for windfalls. The main character is described as grabbing unexpected chances and often bluffing his way through a slippery existence. But according to the Kilos narrator, all Icelanders are in fact reluctant to unambiguously settle anything once and for all. Uh, few things tortured them more than fixed sizes well-prepared decisions, sealed contracts, and detailed plans. These are people used to navigating a reality where, for example, the horrors of shipwrecks can suddenly turn into a salvaging feast where everything is turned upside down, ships, mountains, and men. With those words, the narrator of the Kilos describes the carnival that breaks out when a Norwegian supply ship runs aground close to shore and every man drops what he is doing and runs to the feast. Through the ages, shipwrecks often were a blessing for Icelanders suffering from trading restrictions. You could find all kinds of food, drink, and wares in stranded ships, and even built houses out of their wood. The story of the shipwreck in many ways captures the carnivalesque spirit of the books. Everyone on board survives and only the pride of the drunken ship captain is hurt as he remains alone in his wreck and must watch the goods from his ship being salvaged with a special emphasis on bringing ashore all the wine, which is then greatly enjoyed by the rescuers. When the rescuers find the drenched luxury goods of the ship, they are set to enter a fairy tale, and soon laughter, singing, and yells are heard. 
The beach was one great feast. Men sung and fought and banked glasses, grimaced, threw up and pissed. Here, everyone was friends, all of them, the crews of all boats, men from the south and west, north and east, shark hunters and heron catchers, poor boys and wealthy, Norwegian and Icelandic, everything had fused into one bundle of men, joyfully singing and genuinely crying. According to Bakhtin, the carnival has a universal spirit where everyone takes part in a temporary liberation, which marks the suspension of all hierarchical rank, privileges, norms, and prohibitions. Accordingly, in the Kilos Carnival, self-crowned kings sit in excellent thrones and throw stones at the ship's captain, enjoying a moment uh, outside of time and the world and reality. Here there were no masters, no police, no women, no duties. With these words, however, the narrator reminds us that this carnival's universal spirit only applies to the men. The women are obviously excluded and reduced to the function of guardians of societal order. The irony is that this carnival originates from the sea, which has been described as a female element earlier in the story, an element that was missing in patriarchal Christianity. The sea is namely the mother, woman, the deep itself, where life comes from. In all other religions, heathenry, Hindu, Buddhism, Tao, Athens, Rome, women are both gods and goddesses, worshipped and existing. But this god of ours is a bachelor through and through. It does not mount a female except once in every 3,000 years or so. Helga Kress has discussed flow and water as a feminine element and sign in Icelandic medieval literature the opposite of hardness, the male system of solid laws and rules. Men are portrayed as constantly building ships and sailing them, but also wrecking them so they have to perform, perform acts of heroism. Water is dangerous for men, and that is why they try to conquer it. The struggle with this element confirms their power over the feminine. Yeah. The same applies in modern fiction, according to Runar Helgi Vignesson, who has pointed out the sexualized imagery of feminized ships and ocean in Icelandic novels from the 1990s, where young men at sea go through an archetypical rite of passage. Man meets nature, the monster that the hero must con conquer to earn the princess. But why is our gendered relationship with nature important? Uh, Ecofeminists have pointed out that traditional Im imagery of feminized nature being conquered by men reveals, but also sustains the problematic hierarchical ideology that has brought about contemporary ecological crisis like climate change and species extinction. Ecofeminism's basic premise is that the ideology which authorizes oppression such as those based on race, class, gender, sexuality, physical abilities and species is the same ideology which sanctions the oppression of nature. I therefore argue that ecofeminist emphasis may never have been more important for global warming demands that we consider the larger planetary context and solutions that touch on every aspect of our existence. Man's supposed dominion over nature seems kind of comic when it comes to the ocean, the most unruly and unknown part of nature. For the most part of modern history, we have been very far from mapping, understanding, and controlling the ocean. The natural sciences will, of course, chart the ocean more and more, and technological development will take us deeper into territories where we have never been before in our efforts to master the ocean. And we have changed it in a degree we didn't believe possible as a terraforming force, but this will hit us back if we reach a tipping point. And this is something Søren has uh, uh, written about. Uh, this reflects that the concept of the Anthropocene is deeply paradoxical. It refers mostly to man's potency, but the irony is that we have used our power to maybe become impotent in the future. Such paradoxes are exactly what makes the sea uh, the key element of the carnival in the kilos. The sea is a source of life-giving nourishment, but it also regularly draws the semen harvesting it into a wet grave. 
It is via the ocean that merchants appear and supply goods, but these merchants also swindle people out of their fortunes. And the sea is the road to new opportunities, but seamanship can lead into oppression and work slavery. This ambivalence and the associations with an unruly female force characterized by flow and clear boundaries, the deep, the uncontrollable and the ever changing provides the carnivalesque driving force of the story. Ships are certainly the sphere of men in the kilos with these civilized constructs, they tame and exploit the brute natural forces, but at the ship, shipwreck feast in the kilos, Everything is drenched in alcohol, seawater, and tears streaming from the eyes of singing men. At this carnival, the men temporarily abandon themselves to the flowing element of water and get a release from their role as masters and oppressors. Here it is worth pointing out that Bakhtin's carnival contains a critic of modernity. It has a utopian trait. Uh, hinting at the possibility for another kind of society. And that the Kilos, like all other historical novels, is, past, is partly a commentary on contemporary society and on our myths about the past. As we grow more aware of the urgent need to transform mankind's relationship with its environment, literary descriptions of the ocean, such as can be found in the Kilos, can offer creative ways for changing our perspectives. We know the history of the herring adventure in Iceland, but retelling it in a carnivalesque fashion gives us a new perspective on it and maybe even a new outlook on the world like the Carnival Bakhtin describes. An outlook that might help us accommodate the fact that the smallest phytoplanktons can build up or ruin societies. The problem is Bakhtin's Carnival is a temporary relief from traditional social hierarchies. By engaging in a flow traditionally ascribed to women, the men in the Kilos uh, shipwreck carnival experience a temporary emotional reversal of roles. But the herring carnival in the Kilos does not go as far as to challenge the foundations of patriarchy. Although the carnival can be seen as the site of insurgency, temporary loss of boundaries tends to redefine social frames and such topsy-turvy or timeout is inevitably set back on course. Natalie Simon Davis uh, points out how temporary carnivalesque reversals of power structures are even ultimately sources of order and stability in a hierarchical society. They can clarify the structure by the process of reversing it. We have known for a long time that fluctuations on a micro scale can cause collapses in our ecosystems. And nevertheless, we still are caught up in our toxic and intertwined power systems where man exploits nature without restraint and at the risk of tipping the balance so much that we reach a point of no return. It is tempting to conclude that instead of being spurred to make permanent changes, we have resorted to only intermittently face the need to change course. For example, by abandoning ourselves to the idea of the equal importance of all beings as expressed in literature, art, and popular culture, and thereby getting a temporary relief for our awareness of the root of the problem. Um, but Mary Rosso she, uh, argues, however, that the extreme difficulty of producing lasting social change does not diminish the usefulness of these symbolic models of transgression. So we are suggesting that Bakhtin's philosophy of the carnival, this cultural concept can be taken into the field of biology and geology as an analogy of what we are in need of as an earth system. And that involves us being lowered from our pedestal. As humans, we cannot escape our special position, but we need temporary topsy-turvy of the carnival to remind us that we are just one creature of many, uh, to tear us out of our sense of exceptionality and see the bigger picture. Um, 
of course, the philosophy of the carnival is not the solution. Uh, there is no simple solution, but it is an example of how literature can help us change perspectives and different perspectives are what we most desperately need now in dealing with climate change. So now I have finished. <laughs>